Welcome everybody. Welcome to Artist Talk here at Rio Hondo College. And today I'm with Helen Chung, who has a solo show here at Rio Hondo College. I'm so glad you were able to come and join us today. So Thank you. I want to start with, you've had such a great life and such a great life in art. And so I'd like to first talk about how you got into art. You started very young. Um, well, yes, I went to Art Center when I was 17, uh, while I was still in high school. Um, I ended up taking a night course that um, one of the teachers sort of um, liked uh, what I was doing quite a bit, and he ended up introducing me to the principal who allowed me to start taking night courses there. So I was earning credits before I actually got it, I actually finished high school. So I, in that sense, it seems like I got started very early. But, um, but then after Art Center, I, I did digress by working in the design field for a couple of decades. So it doesn't feel like I started early. But, but I, in terms of, yeah, in terms, I mean, I've always drawn since I was a very little child. So. You went to Art Center as mm -hmm. an illustrator. Yeah, I did take an illustration course first, and then I switched to fine art at the end. And so... Um, but what's amazing is it seems like right after you graduated, you were on a plane off to Japan to work. Yes, actually that was right before I graduated. I had still had three semest two semesters left and uh, I remember one of the teachers, um, Philip Hayes, he was the illustration chair department chairman. He already had um, um, offered me a job to be a teacher. Um, for a figurative class, figure, figure painting class, figure drawing class in Art Center. But I thought I, you know, I wasn't sure what I was gonna do, so I said I'd think about it. And then I went to Japan to visit a friend of mine and somehow I ended up getting a job um, through her. She was very well connected, I would say, uh, with a very, very famous designer. So. I worked there for almost a year. I went there with a one little suitcase and I just like stayed. Um, but I was only 21, so I, I got homesick at the end of, you know, like a, almost a year. I had to come back to LA. I, I literally missed my friends and my mom and all that, so. And then I went to, uh, I, I finished Art Center, then went to Fashion Institute and learned how to do pattern making and all that so I could actually be a legitimate fashion designer. Um, but through Kanzai Mamoto, I got to learn how to design shoes. So even though I took some of the jobs that were available in, L in LA um, in my early 20s, obviously, I, I wanted to design shoes and I went to New York. I met some people that introduced me to other people in Italy. I ended up actually designing shoes for the next couple of decades. So that's pretty much. Um, and then I did other things too. I, 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 I wasn't very good at lasting in one job for very long, so I did a lot of freelance work. And um, um, eventually, some of these freelance jobs, um, they, were, they were really great for the time being, but I think I wanted to have my own company. I think I had a giant ego. So anyway, I ended up uh, having a company of my own, designing shoes, and uh, that lasted a little bit of time. And then I also had a, an opportunity to design um, handloom sweaters. <laughs> People sort of um, invited me to do these, these gigs that were kind of cool deals for a very young person. So that's how I spent my 20s and... But you're being modest. You work with some amazing people in Italy, in France. I mean, yeah. you were a young kid coming out of art school that all of a sudden was on this wonderful track, you know, across the channel. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end, I think I was lucky. I, I, I lived my life, you know, I lived sort of the life that fell into my lap, let's say. And um, when I had to go out of my way to look for different kind of um, things, designing for people, let's say. Um, I was starting to get very, uh, I, think, I think just the whole corporate environment bothered me very, very much. So towards the end, I was 
kind of thinking about coming back to making art, you know, which is what I initially studied, and that's one of the things my, my high school teacher really sort of rooted for me to do, is like, you have to make art, this is what you're supposed to do, but I digressed, and I was very passionate about fashion and all that, but uh, the corporate in sort of environment and um, this thing called product placement that ha started happening very much in the 90s, I ended up, um, yeah, I, I was very happy to, I was happy to solve problems for these other people because it was kind of a, you know, the, the, the one sort of problem being like, it has to be wearable and it has to be aesthetic, but I wanted to come up with my own problems to solve in the end. So I uh, came back to making art. I just threw in the towel. But um, it, it was all sort of, uh, I would say, predicated. I mean, it was very much a reaction to also my, maybe, maybe the longest relationship ending by him passing away. So I needed a big change, and it was like the perfect time. I didn't care if I were going to make money or not. So, so I got rid of my day jobs and I just cold turkey started making work at home, you know, without a studio yet. Um, but that's a big thing. You <laughs> dumped Europe and got back on the plane <laughs> and reinvented yourself. Yeah, I did sense. a lot of traveling. I was like, well, I'm done with traveling. <laughs> um, but um, 20, 2009, I started making art solely and um, I remember having like Rosamund Felsen come over and liking what I was doing and things like that and she's soon closed but she gave me really good feedback. And now you're back in LA mm -hmm. and have been. you have to figure out okay I'm going to be a fine artist now you know I do consider fashion a great art form but it's very different. And mm -hmm. now I'm gonna create sculpture and paintings. Um, how did you come up with what you wanted to make and a game plan? And how did your career in fashion influence, and obviously there is an influence in the art here in this gallery. Yeah, I mean, it was inevitable that I would, uh, you know, make my art be informed by whatever I've experienced the past previous 20 years or so, right? So uh, I gathered things that were around me, you know, whether they were just uh, objects of, uh, like, shoes. <laughs> I decided to make shoe boxes that were exactly mimicking the shapes of shoes. So that was the first thing I had in mind. I had kind of a very specific ideas of what projects I wanted to make uh, just getting into making art, like just getting in, you know, just deciding I'm going to, I'm an artist, this is what I'm going to do. I had three or four projects that I um, worked out fairly. It, it wasn't like a game plan, but it was, I had to construct certain things. So um, I made patterns of these shoes boxes, and then I was starting to already cr crumple shopping bags that I collected over the years. And my friends loved them, and they kept on giving me more bags. So I had like more bags than you could, you know. So, I, I'd love to, to talk about the bags just a little bit. I mean, But I'd that was love... already like, you know, after, okay, 2009, I had a show that I was invited to be uh, part of a group show so um, by, by John Souza, a very good friend of mine. So I did a show there doing three sculptures, and that was um, um, using PVC piping. To make the long story short, that was also informed by my sort of fashion background, let's say. Um, I used three particular fabric, um, iconic fabric design, one being plaid, one being... Um, Paisley, another being um, Houndstooth. So I kind of linked stories that I've read with, with those, those um, uh, designs. But after that, I, I was continuing to work on three or four projects that some of them actually had to depend on enough funds to make. So they're kind of still, they, they were put on a shelf. But um, um, the shoebox and, and, and the shopping bags things were already kind of in the works. And then finally, 2014, I was invited to do a solo show at West LA College. That's when the, the, sho the shopping bag sculptures were actually displayed. They were literally like 50. I, actually, I had to edit it down to about 26 or something, but that's where they were first shown. And um, 
uh, I mean, it's, it seems like, I mean, maybe I, I should explain how and why I chose shopping bags. I, I think I wanted to talk about fashion, not necessarily, I didn't want to make objects again that were sort of reminding people of fashion necessarily, but I wanted to kind of look at things like disposable object like um, that had, it basically was a container. I think of it as um, um, kind of a subordinate object as opposed to an object because it's its own, its own sort of, its sole purpose is to service other objects, you know. So it, it's, it's like really at the bottom of the object hood. <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to work with something like that that had so much potential because it, it has properties that, you know, that, that, that are unlike architecture in that it's six-sided. You know, it has one opening on top where the architecture of the opening is at the bottom. Uh, so there, the, the function of it being having walls where you, you have inside and outside, that conversation could be had with bags as well. And I, I found that to be an interesting place to go, like psychologically, you know. And I, I was reading a lot of philosophy and psychology, so it, that's, that's how I was viewing it. But bags have an identity. We, right. We talked about this a little bit. And whether now bags in itself have become a fashion thing, like is the bag from Prada or Gucci or a brown bag? And you're I think taking, it's going away, though. I think it's... You're taking away the identity. Oh, right. How the, does that... The first... Well, when I, when I, when I read the book uh, No Logo uh, by Naomi Klein in 1999, I mean, I didn't read it then. I read it later. But um, I wanted to to do this project actually after having read that because it talks about the sort of the market bullies, the whole globalization having to take away a lot of small businesses. And, um, and I personally had a problem with going to shops and you know some of my favorite things that I wanted to buy were discontinued because they didn't have enough buyers. The least popular things, they always drop in the line. So, um, I personally had issues with that. Like even in a small, even in a big store like IKEA, my favorite table discontinued. You know, so so the whole idea of like I wanted all the variety of things to exist, but it, in this marketplace where the biggest sellers are the only things that you're going to see, you're going to have less competition in terms of less interesting designs to even compare it with. I mean, look at even computer line. You have just IBM and Mac. You don't really have anything else. So it's, it's that kind of thing I, I was having, I was thinking about and having issues with. So that uh, was maybe to some degree a um, um, yeah, point of departure. And when you talk about why did I take away this, the names of these big brand name bags, well, that was exactly the point. I didn't necessarily want to give them more attention. I, at first I actually had taken out F is their names by painting over them, but I actually was crazy enough to think, okay, I'm gonna use words from like Marx's um, uh, communism manifesto, like words like common or property, and I sort of dismantled the word and <laughs> made them into like, Terry Porp is property, common became monocom. I, I was trying to make words that sounded like shop names. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So they look like bags that belong to these shops that you, you know, never heard of. Then I, then I started dismantling, I started deconstructing these bags and cutting and, you know, then all these really, really painstakingly painted names end up being like not even seeable. So that was kind of a masochistic thing. I just thought, okay, I don't need the names. <laughs> if they're going to be impossible to see, what's the point, right? So that was my first idea. So I, I, somebody actually bought, like Davida from Night Gallery, she bought um, a sculpture that, that has Terry Porp on it, which really is my dismantled word of property. And I thought about like other names that I could use, you know, like credit, credit default swap or something, you know, from 2007 and eight crash. <laughs> that, that all has to do with this crazy financialization of everything. And uh, I would, if I dismantled that, those two words, it would be impossible. So, so that was what I did with the shopping bags. And, and the whole idea of shopping too, I wanted to look at it um, 
from a psychological and philosophical, philosophical point of view a little bit um, because, because there's mo much more to it than just it being um, um, a container that you take away other objects with. It, um, shopping uh, it alone has many sort of, you know, sort of, sort of different meanings depending on if you're food shopping or if you're buying really luxury goods. I mean, we often think of shopping as something very um, trivial. I mean, when you live in a very rich country like we do, there's a lot of excess in shopping, right? So obviously that sometimes is what we associate with shopping. But if you, even in something like uh, Philosophical Investigations by Wittgenstein, I mean, he's talking about the use of language being the, the actual um, meaning maker of language. And he chooses, in fact, the scene of the shop, people shopping. And so it's, a, it's, it's an essential part of our lives. So, so, I, so I'm not really necessarily criticizing you know, the idea of shopping, but there's like psychologically different ways to spin it. You know? So I think that's, that's what I was doing with these shopping bag sculptures. I, I wanted to make each one very, very sort of uniquely different. And then that's why I showed it like in a sort of um, uh, form of a, a, a runway fashion show, a tea. And so they were all placed on it and um, as if, as if, it, as if it, you know, were a catwalk or something. And then I thought I need to do something more with these bags because I started looking at it with my little camera and I just saw that it has so many different sides, including inside. So I stuck the camera inside and I, I came up with a whole line of photographs and that's what was the second um, offshoot of these shopping bags. And I don't know if you can show some of those. Now, there. that's a big change. I mean, we're surrounded by some of your, especially the paintings. You went for something that's really bold 3D sculptural work to... From something trivial. Right, from something that's sort of discarded, something, but not so much anymore. I mean, I have young daughters and... Uh, <laughs> Well, they they're Her probably going to become collectibles because they're going to be less and less of them available because now everyone's going to use fabric bags, too. So yes. there's Her croissant comes in a super fancy bag. All you know, girls I'm love like, bags. It's a feminine it's thing. It's insane. I, I don't get it. You pay more for the bag <laughs> than the croissant. But you managed to transition from these great sculptures into a whole new body of work. Can you tell us how... About the paintings or the, the sculptures? The Both the photos, photos and the paintings, how they fed into each other and how you made that artistic decision. Right. Um, so when, <clears throat> actually a friend of mine gave me a studio visit, um, uh, whose work also I really, really love. Um, he, he was looking at them and he was saying, you know, Jasper Johns, I totally get it. Like Jasper Johns was a very famous statement, take an object and do something to it and then do something else to it. And he was explaining his whole process of, you know, making paintings into objects and things like that. But I was <coughs> thinking like, yeah, that's, I suppose that's the first stage of what I do. That's, but then I, I think I do, I think that's what you see a lot of the times making the medium itself important in, in making an object. Like you just do a bunch of different things to a one object. And um, that itself becomes art. But I'm, probably doing more of this where I take an object, idea, or material, and I, I like to sort of not necessarily do something to that alone, but take that and examine it from different views, different angles, different maybe even material, and just spin off of it into different bodies of work. So it's just a, just a, just a you know, um, a point of departure, just a starting point, and then I I can re-examine it from a different material. That's why these paintings are, they, 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 that's how they were born. Now for our audience, and especially the students in that, you know, going from 3D to 2D, are you photograph looking at an angle, photographing no. it, putting no, it into a computer, done. or do you just find the side you want in? No, these down? are definitely, that's why they don't necessarily look like one side that you would find when you're looking at the sculptures. Uh, because when I'm looking at them, you know, light from life, they're actually like a little object that's like a little creature in front of me. It's almost like taking a 
uh, it's, it's not too different from doing my portraits, but because it's an inanimate object, um, there's no particularly like one side, like a, a person's face. Um, I mean, meaning like one feature that I want to capture or anything. So I end up, my eyes actually wander around and I do end up seeing many sides at the same time. Maybe not the, at the same time, but um, each time I look, it's hard to concentrate on exactly where I was on the, was, I was looking earlier, you know, a few, min, few seconds before. So it ends up being that I, I can capture multiple sides at the same time. And that's, I ended up liking that and I purposely actually even turn it and then, and then incorporate that into make a composition interesting. So they're, they're like just a loose interpretation of a still life. And, and the whole idea behind that is that uh, I want to include every side. I want to be very, very treating each, each, every side of a sculpture, you know, with equal attention. So it's like a super democratic move, actually. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, I think it's ma mainly because I am always interested in leveling things to where there's no hierarchy in what view we prefer and what is a better side, what is a back side or front side, or what is inside and outside. So I'm always trying to sort of make, make that very blurry. So Now, as artists, we have, and this is something all artists or most artists have to deal with it at some point. You made this huge jump and change. You went from sculpture to photo and paintings. You have a wonderful following and a great group of collectors that just love your work. How did they respond to that change and how are, how's that going for you? Oh, well, um, I wouldn't say I have a huge amount of collectors, but I have some collectors that do support me and, um, in certain things and I'm very grateful for that. I found, how does it work for me? How did you find, a lot of times, sometimes artists, when they switch from one body to the next, like I consider you sort of more of a renaissance artist. When I'm in your <laughs> studio, you have all these projects, whether you bring them to, you're always experimenting. And when you make a larger change, sometimes artists are like, no, I just want that. Why are you doing, you know, well, there are, that? Yes. And the, how did that work for you? That was a big change. I think there are those people who, would prefer me to stay in one place longer. Um, but because I work with different genres at the same time, not necessarily on the same day, but they, they tend to be progressing through, uh, you know, a sa same period. Um, they see that I'm giving equal attention to every, every one of those genres. And once they've gotten to know my work enough, you know, they, they might prefer one over the other, but they do see how they're each growing and each kind of developing into something even, you know, a little bit more um, concrete, you know, make necessarily concrete, I mean, more developed. Um, so um, I would say some people really prefer the abstract work and, and, and a lot of people really like my figurative work. That's even a, a spin off of the, portraiture that I do. So um, it's nice to have, it's nice to have these, you know, balancing type of collectors, I guess. Um, I, but I won't make art for a particular collector necessarily. You know, I'll make what I'll make. And now you brought up that you do portraitures and you brought it up a couple times. And a lot of us, and we've talked about this before, have day jobs. Look, I'm here, I teach, you know, I make my art. So you do very well doing portraitures. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how it affects your art and how you feel, I guess we'll call it your day job in a sense. Um, I'm trying to remember. Well, actually, yeah, I do call it my day job. I'm not sure how incredibly well I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing fine. I mean, I you know, make a living doing it. Um, I would say, I would say I, I still think of it as um, part of my artwork. And obviously, because um, I'm very invested in it as well. Um, it's not, it's something that 
is much more innate. Like I can get up and it can just be done. Whereas other ones take a lot more sort of, you know, planning and um, designing and thinking of the materials and how to get made and things like that. Whereas portraits are really sort of low um, maintenance, you know, or um, so, so, so it's something that I do pretty easily, not, not necessarily when someone's sitting in front of me, it's so easy because I, I want to do my best in capturing that person as well as introducing, introducing something different, um, something new. Um, so it depends on the person. I, I play with a little bit of what's in the background. I, I imagine the, I reimagine the background and sort of incorporate that into the work. Um, sometimes I mix it up with what's really real. Um, so you don't necessarily have to, you don't get to really always um, predict what, what I, I do, right? So it's nice to be able to mix it all up. Um, and if I'm invited to someone's house for commission work, I think that they like the idea of me capturing their environment too. So, because their, their whole room represents them. So I, I'm more faithful to that in that sense. Um, but then I always do ask them, like, if I can change this and that, because that's, I'm making, I'm making art. I'm not, I'm not taking a photograph, you know? So, uh, I forgot your question, sorry. We were talking about portraitures mm. and, you know, having it as, I guess, there's always that competition between your day job or what we'll, we'll call sort of, oh, right. I mean, it's art, you're making art versus with, you know, your more abstract work. I mean, we could call it your figurative versus abstract because they're both art and it's just different. Yeah, and then in the, even in the figurative work, there's like portraitures work from people and then figurative work that I do that's um, a, a lot more imagined, somewhat, you know, sort of bordering on the surreal. So there's even that, there's even a kind of a couple of different, I don't know, um, versions of figurative work there. But um, yes, I think, what, I know what you mean. Like you're saying, do they compete with each other in some ways? No, um, I, I, I have my own control of how many portraits I will take while I'm working on something very sort of rigorous and very planned and very, that needs 100% of my focus. Then I will, I will make the portraits wait. You know, I will, I will do less of them. So it's a little bit, I, I think I'm lucky in that sense that it's not like a typical day job where you are expected at a certain place from a certain hour to um, a certain time to time. I mean, and I, I think I have a, a little more leeway in terms of when I decide to do them. So Now in terms of technical But I like skill. doing it all the time at the end of the day. Like it's like something like, you know, making food and eating it. It's like for me, it's simply a joy. It just... I, I, and it comes to, to some degree, certain parts of it come easy to me because I've drawn since I was like five or something. But I think that um, I don't want to do things that come easy. So I always want to make it a little bit more complex. Now, in terms of technical skill, what's the most challenging or, or difficult task in making your art? Um, is there a pro part of the process of making art which you find like really difficult to master or frustrating, you know, dealing with the ideas and interpreting what you're doing? Um, well, I did have this, um, I did design um, a pair of crutches. I had a few different models. I did that regardless of, I mean, one gallery showed interest, so I just went, went ahead you know, spent the money, bought a bunch of crutches, and I cut them up with some miter saw and started assembling these deconstructed crutches, basically. And um, I, I was inspired by, or I shouldn't say inspired, but I, I was upset that Trump may be a nominee in the Republican Party. So I already thought about, like, this democracy is not working if this guy is actually going to run. So I had um, this idea, and then once he did win, I decided I'm going to make this. And because it, it seemed like we have obviously a democratic country, but somehow 
it just seems that such a corrupt person to be able to actually run w with having to even pay a giant fee, you know, for a, a, a kind of a, a fraudulent school that everyone knew about, then he gets to be the president anyway. And I found, I found that to be kind of a farcical. So this, these sculptures uh, were the hardest things I made because I had to saw, I had to use the saw for like six months to get them to be perfect. It was literally killing me physically, <laughs> but I'm glad that I did them, and, um, uh, and I personally find them beautiful. But they, they look like the crutches themselves went through an accident, basically. But, but part of it is also sort of autobiographical, because I, I was klutz my whole my life, my whole life, I mean, and I was falling and um, having accidents all the time, so I had a a uh, few sets of crutches already in my garage from different accidents. So um, those are the first ones I, you know, chopped up and uh, used as um, s sort of just to see if it works or not, you know, what, what, could, what could I do with them? So, um, um, and I think that that project is not over either, even though I've made one, it was just, like, in ridiculously difficult because the dowels, um, roll when you're saw when you're sawing them so and I was making angles that were like 110 and you know 25 degrees angles so they would you know they each had different angles and they also sort of twist and 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 while they're twisting um, the next one that fits in if it's not even if it's even a, a sixteenth of an inch off it will make the next piece go this like exponentially off the, 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 you know, presumed mark. So it was kind of a nightmare. Like sometimes I thought, okay, I would like kind of fix all the, court, you know, ends together with uh, steel tape. So it, I felt like it was pretty solid. And then I was like, it's looking like it's gonna work. And I had to join the, the junctures, three places where the arm rests and where the hand goes and at the bottom where it has to taper down into one one um, stick, you know, that goes into the little suction thing, right? So those three junctures has to have to be meeting perpendicularly, and in order to do this kind of zigzag thing, and then still have perpendicular areas, not perpendicular, I'm sorry, um, parallel is what I meant. <laughs> so that, that was almost like impossible, but I did it. I was like, wow, I did it. It was like, I hired two carpenters and they quit because they couldn't deal with those angles. They were just ridiculous. They were, they were each miter saw comes with only, you know, capacity to do 50 degree angle. So I had to figure out how to do angles that were, you know, sort of wider than that. So I had to design a little wedge, cut a little wedge of a piece of wood so I could add to it. And then that's how I would cut, you know, something that was that or this. But whatever, it, it was worth it, but um, was it worth it? I don't know. I thought so. I saw them in your studio. I thought they were quite, quite <laughs> So that remarkable. was the most physically, technically difficult thing I had to do. And uh, otherwise... Um, well, when we, let's use one of your bags as an example. You go into your studio. Mm -hmm. You got the Gucci bag, the Prada bag, the no-name bag. Mm -hmm. How do you go about deciding... I'm gonna create this wonderful shape, and then the painting. I mean, you're painting these bags, so they are not only, they're painted sculptures. So can you talk a little bit about the philosophy and what goes into that creative process? Philosophy, um, I mean, philosophy in just wanting to um, include every side because I, think that certain sides are ignored most of the time. Something like inside of a sculpture is usually ignored. Um, maybe that's what I wanted to include. And, but in, in terms of how did I jump to that, it's just, I don't know, it's hard to explain something like that. I think many artists just end up there because they're always thinking, you know? It's really not a, there's no formula to it and there's no, um, like a, yeah, definitely um, um, I like being able to sort of, you know, 
spin things in different angles, different uh, angles is probably not the right word, but different um, uh, uh, I mean, yes, changing mediums is one thing, but I, I like being able to observe something and then sort of comment on it with another object, you know? Did That's you what I feel like these are. always paint the bags? Or did you, were the original ones the raw these bags? These ones, the yeah. sculptures? When we talk about the sculpture bags, did you always paint them or did you use them, the early ones, were they raw? What made you in the very beginning, to be painted? In the very beginning, there was one little brown bag that already had gingham on it. And I just thought, outside has a gingham, inside is just brown bag. And I just thought they were, that was lovely. So I, that was like the first bag I kind of, I actually thought that I could repeat them if I really liked the shape because I was just doing it so intuitively. I would just cut. There were, <coughs> no, there were no pieces taken out. There was nothing added. So it was just its own body is all I was working with. So I'm being like very faithful to the bagness. <laughs> and so I would um, yeah, sort of cut some things and then, then all I used was staple. There was no glue involved. And so that one kind of had this inside turn out and things like that so I could see the inside as well as the outside. So the inside was the not, not printed part and the outside was the printed part, right? So already I kind of had an idea, okay, I'm going to paint other bags that are all the same size. So I would, I would know which is the outside and which is inside. So that was already apparent to me I should do. And that way I always have a, sort of a conversation about inside and outside in every, every bag. And um, so that was like the first inkling I had. Then I had some ideas about Oh, the strings are even interesting. I'm going to include the strings in them. Why take anything out? So the strings are part of the bags. And, but I painted every one. Um, you know, obviously I didn't want to paint people on it or something. I, I painted every one as if I'm sort of making a, an abstract painting. You know, sort of enough, not, not so interesting that you don't want to crumple it and then take away from whatever composition you made, but make enough of a, and not use too many colors so that it ends up being, um, well, yeah. So there was, there was some decisions to be made so that I can really sort of cash in on the idea of the inside and outside. So that's how they um, each individually sort of evolved. And it was, an, it was fairly an intuitive process, but a friend of mine kind of mentioned this thing about the chaotic, you know, chaos, like is there any kind of a, um, was I interested in chaotic sort of, um, I mean, the, the whole idea of chaos theory is something she knew that I was studying and was interested in, but I wasn't really applying it consciously. It's just that I know that I can't repeat any of these things. Even if the, I can make it seem like they're alike, there's no way I can repeat any, any it just, that just never happens. It just, it's just, that's actually the law of chaos. Even if the designs can seem like they're repeating, they never, they never go back to the exact same line, because it, it, because there's too many vari there's just too many variances, too too many variables in life, that there's no reason for it to exactly repeat itself. I mean, I'm not sure there is if nobody can actually explain the reason why this is. It's just the way it is, you know. So um, that's I don't know. I probably didn't answer your question too much. Oh, you answered it great. Okay. I had the pleasure. Sure. Um, over the last couple of weeks of bringing in students to see your show. And, and they've been so fascinated about the transition, or about the work, and sort of as I explained to them some of the ideas about the work. How do you, what do you hope audience will get out of your artwork? Hmm. Um, I, think, I think I'd be very flattered if they didn't um, just like you know, they weren't just drawn to it from sort of its, its, its um, aesthetic appeal, but um, they were actually interested in what I was thinking about when I made them. You know, if they were curious enough about, well, what drove her to do this? Are there messages in it? There, is she working with some problems while she's doing this? I think that would be the most flattering thing I could, um, you know, imagine from a, a, a viewer. Wonderful. Now, we are coming to the end. Um, where can people see 
more of your work. And we get, <laughs> I think Grant may be our, our dean who has been wonderful in hosting this. Uh, you have a website. Mm -hmm. Are we able to throw up the website? Wonderful. So you'll be able right to do the video. Right now it's doing something weird, but yes. And go see the website, Instagram, um, Facebook. Yes. That's, those are the places you can see them right now, but hopefully in galleries very soon. So a little bit, but hopefully those social medias will point to future shows for you. And once thank again, you so much. <laughs> I want to thank you. It's been such a pleasure to have you and such a pleasure to host your artwork in our gallery. I'd like to thank the Dean Grant and our administration, Teresa, our president, who always supports this and this project, and Wendy and Abby, um, who work in this office for making all everything happen here at the gallery. So Helen, thank you so much for your time today. Thank it was you. an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. <laughs>